These two are survivors of the First World War. A deadly harvest of metal that has lain unexploded beneath the fields of Flanders for over three quarters of a century. Together with the last few surviving veterans and the countless military cemeteries of the West Hook, they continue to stand as a reminder of the savagery of this, the cruelest of all wars. It all began at Sarajevo on the 28th of June 1914, when the Crown Prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Prince Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a Serb nationalist. The shot that was fired by Gavrilo Princip proved to be the signal for four years of continuous slaughter. Austria and Germany declared war on Serbia, unleashing a chain reaction of alliances which, one by one, drew all the major powers into the conflict. Not even little Belgium was safe, and on the 4th of August 1914, the armies of the Kaiser invaded. King Albert I responded by announcing a general mobilization, and 180,000 reservists and 20,000 volunteers raced to join the colors. Throughout August, the outnumbered Belgian army held on bravely. The bastion at Liège defied the might of the German guns for 10 long days. But heroism alone was not enough, and overwhelmed by the sheer numerical superiority of the Germans, King Albert's army was gradually pushed back. The first soldiers we saw here were a company of German cavalry. They advanced to the Cat's Hill and there they ran into an Englishman who shot dead the Crown Prince. After that, there was no end to it. The British sent their volunteers and then the French arrived, the dragoons and the chasseurs from Lille with their bicycles. You should have seen it, lad. It was a war. It was indeed war, and a war that would last far longer than anyone at the time could possibly imagine. Against all odds, the triumphant German advance was gradually brought to a halt, and in the West Hook during the month of October 1914, the Kaiser's armies repeatedly failed to break the dogged resistance offered by the British, French and Belgian troops. With further advance out of the question, the Germans dug in, and so began the deadly process of trench warfare. I joined up as a volunteer. I was just 18 and a half years old. From the first day of the war right to the very last, I was in it. I saw the whole thing and was only lightly wounded once. The hardest times I had were during the Battle of the Yser. 14 days it lasted, from the 15th of October to the 1st of November. We really did suffer. Shortages of everything. No proper clothing to replace our battered uniforms, not even any regular food, since the field kitchens and the ration stores had all been left behind. Yes, those 14 days, they were the worst. And most terrible of all was the fighting at Ramskapelle. That night, the 29th of October 1914, was the worst of my entire life. It was awful. They were wounded and dying everywhere. The French were sent up to help us, since we were no longer of any use as soldiers. We were totally worn out. I was only 18 and a half years old. But if they had shot us all at that moment, I don't think I would have minded. We were all mixed up. The French, the Germans and us, so mixed up that we were not even supposed to fire our rifles. But I did it anyway. And that's how I saved my life there. If I hadn't done it to him, the German would have done it to me. I don't like wearing medals, because medals are the symbols of murderers. That's what we all were, murderers. Even the Germans were someone's children. But like I said, if it wasn't him, it would have been me.
In the beginning I was a patriot, but my patriotism soon disappeared when I saw what it was doing to us. There were always enough men, so they just treated us like any other piece of war equipment. If a horse was killed, you had to make out a report. If a man was killed, nothing much was said. The soldiers who fell at the front during the heavy fighting were simply buried where they fell. It didn't seem to count for anything. Terrible. As the battle raged on the Isère, so new fighting also flared up around Ypres. In October and November 1914, the Germans made repeated attempts to seize the village of Langemark, and although they failed here, they did succeed in capturing Brotzende, Zonnebeke, Gelleveld, Zanvoorde, Hollebeke and Weetschaten. The Allied line was almost broken on several occasions, and only a series of desperate rearguard actions allowed the British Expeditionary Force to hold on until the snows of winter eventually brought the Germans to a complete standstill. In the Belgian sector, the low-lying ground behind the Isère was deliberately flooded to hinder any further German advance. The remnants of the Belgian army dug in on the western edge of this swampland, and there until the end of the war they defiantly held on to the last unoccupied piece of their fatherland. 22nd of April 1915. A dense yellow cloud rolled across the fields. The air was thick with the stench of chlorine, and almost before they knew what was happening, the first victims of gas warfare began to fall. The Second Battle of Ypres had begun. We had just done four days in the trenches and had been relieved that night. At three o'clock in the afternoon, we saw in the distance a cloud rolling across the fields, and the Major said, we said, you guys? Everything was in French in those days, but sure enough, it was gas. In groups of six, we rushed back to the trenches. We had no gas masks, so we had to urinate on our handkerchiefs and press them to our mouths. You couldn't use ordinary water, because it had been contaminated by the gas. Our eyes were streaming, and it was as though someone had grabbed us by the throat. I still have trouble with my breathing and with my eyes. But at a certain moment, the wind changed direction and blew the gas back on our enemies. They already had gas masks, but we didn't. Eventually, we got masks as well. At first, they were just goggles with Mika lenses, but this was only while they were making something better. Later on, we got this better version too. We helped carry away the wounded, and then we came back with sacks of ammunition for the machine gunners. The grenadiers were already lying in position, and we, riflemen, just lay down beside them. The grenadiers had mown down row after row of young German soldiers as they tried to advance. They had all been singing, Uns Vaterland muss grosser werden, which means, our fatherland must grow, but it didn't get any bigger that day. They were wiped out to a man, and they are all buried at Madonna near Langemark. A whole cemetery full of young lads. You could still visit it if you want to. It is hard to imagine that this peaceful setting was once the scene of wholesale slaughter, but this is the same Langemark, where gas once soured the air and where the flower of German youth, advancing with Deutschland über alles on their lips, was mown down row upon row by the waiting British machine gunners. And it is perhaps ironic to note that the statues which now look out over this place were made by a certain Emil Krieger, whose name in English means the warrior. At Vladslo, Peter Kollwitz lies buried. His mother was the sculptress, Katha Kollwitz, and she, perhaps better than anyone else, has captured the sadness, the anger, and the impotence of those who were forced to witness the sacrifice of their sons. At the very spot the murderous gas taps were opened for the first time, 
The cross of reconciliation now reaches up towards the skies. And at St. Julian, a Canadian soldier, standing with reversed arms, keeps watch over the fields where so many of his countrymen fell during the gas attacks of 1915. On the 3rd of May 1915, during a brief lull in the fighting, a Canadian doctor called John McRae wrote a poem, sitting on the canal bank above his dressing station at Essex Farm, near Boozinger. The poem expressed the hopelessness and desperation of the average fighting man, but at the same time appealed to future generations to carry on the fight. McRae's words seemed to capture the spirit of the time, and very soon acquired a worldwide fame as a denunciation of the horrors of the war. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly scarcely heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the flow. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If we break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Exhausted and disillusioned by the horrors he had sought to portray, McRae died at Wimmera on the 28th of January 1918. However, the poppy he wrote about so eloquently has remained an international symbol of remembrance and reconciliation. The atmosphere of peace and serenity which pervades the war cemeteries today stands in stark contrast to the savage brutality of the war years. Where once all was barbed wire, torn earth and shattered trees, there now stand row upon row of clean white headstones each of which, in its own way, conveys the message, you are gone, but not forgotten. Der Deutsche war besser, wenn man bombardieren, nicht so da der Lassen, nicht so wir bombardieren. The Germans were bombing the railway line, and I stuck my head up to get a better look. Just at that moment, something hit me. Soldiers are always playing jokes on each other, and I thought someone was doing this to me now. I got really angry with my mate. What the bloody hell are you doing? Chucking stones at a time like this. But my mate looked at me strangely and asked where all the blood had come from. I took my cap off and sure enough it was soaked in blood. I had been hit in the head by a piece of shell. The soldiers were little more than cannon fodder. For those who were hit, there were only two possible outcomes. Either they would die where they fell on the field of honor, or they would be carried back to first aid post by their comrades. Even those who were lucky enough to survive usually soon found themselves back at the front after they had been patched up. Eh bien, écoutez, l'uniforme fait quelque chose. Par exemple, quand on faisait ses gardes de nuit... The uniform played an important role. Every hour we had to make our rounds, and whenever we came to the ward with the head cases, they all invariably sprang out of bed. I was only 21 years old, and I was very frightened. Every day it was the same routine. I asked them, where do you think you are going? And one of them replied, I have to catch a train. He had even packed his case and he was determined not to miss his train. And I said to him, get back into bed and I will wake you when the train arrives. He immediately did what I had said, for no better reason than someone in a uniform had told him to. It was awful to see.
Here in the West Hook, the war is still not over. Every year, more than 200 tons of munitions are recovered, sometimes from building sites, but mostly from farms. It all finds its way to the bomb disposal depot at Poolkapel. Despite the passage of time, this iron harvest is still potentially lethal, and explosions are not uncommon. Over the years, the locals have come to terms with the threat, but even so, there are still occasional fatalities, yet further victims of a war that never seems to end. 10% of all the munitions recovered are in the highly dangerous category, many of them containing toxic chemicals. Until 1980, it was possible to encase this material in concrete and dump it at sea, but this practice has now been forbidden by the Treaty of Oslo. However, a solution is in sight, and the Belgian government now has clear and specific plans for the setting up of a new incineration unit at Poolkapel, in order to ensure that the ever-increasing stockpile of these deadly munitions can be disposed of safely. I never experienced a heavy attack of gas, but uh, they had a nasty habit of firing ga gas, mustard gas, in, in shells. And when the shell burst, it spread a kind of film, which was, uh, well, as if you got it on your hands and your eyes, you were very much troubled by it. Everyone suffered to a degree, some much more worse than others. Dat werd het toen dat ik woonde daar voor nul aan de meer kinderen aan het brasten van de samen. In the hospital where I was, there were already some Americans who had been wounded on the summer. They had all been in smaller hospitals to begin with, but now they had been transferred to this larger hospital, to be shipped to England when the war ended. I saw a lot of misery and suffering in that place. Many men were badly burned from mustard gas. Gas was also used on our Belgian front, but that was only vitriol gas, which bore no comparison with the dreadful mustard variety. These poor men were burnt all over, from head to foot. One man was lying there in just one half of a burnt shoe and a few tatters of blackened uniform. Others had quite literally been burned black. Most of them were blind as well. And so they lay there naked on their beds, surrounded by a netting to keep the flies away. And it wasn't possible to dress the wounds, since the sores and scabs caused by the gas had to be peeled at least three times and then covered in a white salve, layer after layer of white salve. And even when the wounds began to heal, they still needed the white salve. And how those men screamed and screamed and screamed. Those who are not familiar with their history will find it difficult to imagine the extent to which this peaceful stretch of countryside was made to suffer. How it was torn apart, piece by piece, and drenched with the blood of hundreds of thousands of soldiers. This quiet Flemish hill country was also to be the scene for the opening prologue of the Third Battle of Ypres, the blowing of the mines along the Messines of Eitschater Ridge. Using tunnels pushed forward from the British trenches by special tunnelling companies, Massive charges of high explosive were set under the German front lines. And uh, one of the most objectionable uh, tasks that we had <coughs> was to uh, go down in the sap and assist in the mining. We had a coal miner from the north, from the coal mining area of England, who was doing the actual. Uh, picking, uh, picking away of the chalk. But the infantrymen were down there on their hands and knees, passing back the broken chalk 
for some hours, and of course when they came out, they were choked with sword, with uh, chalk dust, and uh, they couldn't stand up because of their being in the position for so long, you see. It was most objectionable. And of course the worst part of it all was that while you were there in the tiny tunnel, you could hear the Germans picking away around you at the same time. And it was a case of which one blew the other one up first. And you hoped it wouldn't be you. We were in dug dugouts very close to when that mine went up. And I was laid on a bit of a step and it, it threw me on the floor. It was that violent, you know, but uh, we went up after, more, we were more in reserve at that time. I don't know who took, took the, uh, the front line there, but we went up after and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, ready, got ready for any counterattack, you see. At Zillebaker, Plugstedt, but most famously at Weizsgarter and Messines, the German defences were blown sky high by a chain of 19 separate mines. The detonation was so powerful that it was said that it could be heard in London. A 20th mine failed to go off until it was triggered by a storm in 1955, and three further unexploded charges are still believed to be buried underground. Messines was merely a prelude to something much worse. The murderous Third Battle of Ypres would reach its bloody climax six months later at Passchendaele. Field Marshal Haig had wanted to break through on a wide front to capture the U-boat bases at Zeebrugge and Ostend. However, he failed to take sufficient account of the heaviness of the Flemish soil and the unpredictability of the Flemish weather. The attack ground to a halt in a sea of mud amid scenes which bordered on the inhuman. Even so, Haig pressed stubbornly on. He eventually won eight kilometers of ground, but he lost over 450,000 men. The seemingly endless rows of British graves at the imposing Tynecott Cemetery are a grim but eloquent testimony to the futility of war. The rows of crosses in the French cemetery at saint charles de Potesa tell the same story, as do the headstones of the Belgian military cemetery at Houthorst. Rich or poor, old or young, believer or non-believer, no one was safe from the fickle finger of fate. Thousands upon thousands of soldiers, always someone's father, always someone's son. But in 1917, I was uh, in the Ypres area and uh, Actually, our division went in at uh, Pole Capel in the Battle of Passchendaele. That was in uh, uh, November 1917. It, it, the scene of the Battle of Passchendaele is almost indescribable because the whole of the country between the city of Ypres, Ypres and the ridge at Passchendaele was one mass of shell holes. They were waterlogged, half full of mud and water, and uh, that, the Germans looked after their own troops by building pill, uh, concrete pillboxes. But we had to, the British had to line, line the dirt. And it was rather nasty business. They were a collection of shell holes, really. They were, the, uh, the water table in that area was very high and of course the continual shelling had uh, abolished, smashed all the drains and so uh, you, you, you struck water uh, at about 18 inches down so there was very, very little shelter. It was a very t terrible situation really. And of course these holes rapidly, the shell holes rapidly filled with a kind of muddy water and in those shell holes many men died who were wounded and couldn't have seen them.
1918. The end is finally at hand. After the revolution in Russia, the front in the east collapsed. The Germans shifted all their forces to the west in a desperate bid to win the war before the Americans arrived. In spring 1918, they launched their last great offensive. Flugstiert, Messines and Hollebaker were lost, but at Merkham at least, they were checked by the Belgian army. Everywhere else, however, the advance continued. Kemmel Hill and Locker both fell, and only at the foot of the Scherpenberg was the offensive finally brought to a halt. The great gamble had failed. In September 1918, the Germans were driven out of the areas they had won, and as autumn approached, preparations were laid for the final Allied push. Swiss border to the North Sea coast, a furious bombardment was unleashed. Out of the blue, we received an order to attack. This always used to happen around three or four o'clock in the morning with the rising of the sun. We were all given a measured amount of coffee. And there was some kind of spirits in it, but we didn't know what it was. Then our commander spoke to us in French. Boys, he said, your blood no longer belongs to you, but belongs to the tip of your bayonet. And don't forget, I was only 18 years old at the time. I was with one of the last classes to be called up for the war, the class of 1918. I'm 94 now, but I was only 18 when I arrived at the front. Me and my three brothers were all in the army, and one of them was killed at my side in Osterosebeke. He had this in his breast pocket when he was killed. You can still see the impact made by the bullet that pierced his heart. About a year later, I can't remember exactly, we got a letter asking if we wanted him to be dug up and brought back to Poperingen. But my mother said, the poor lad has already been laid to rest and I would rather leave him where he is. And so it is that he still lies buried in the cemetery at Houthulst. It is not known with any certainty how many Belgian troops were killed during the First World War. The estimates vary from 27,000 to 40,000. Officially, there are 15,790 graves, contained in 21 military cemeteries spread across the country. And at Houthulst lies buried Hendrik de Man, who died for his fatherland, but who is still mourned by his brother some 80 years on. Not far away at Klerken stands a mill which was used by the Germans as an observation post during the final offensive. The mill was captured on the 28th of September 1918 by troops of the 2nd Line Regiment. On the day before the great attack, King Albert I wrote, Soldiers, you will put to flight the invader who for four long years has oppressed your brothers. The decisive moment has come. Everywhere the Germans are afraid to fight. The attack was centered on the forest at Hautolst. The German lines were captured one by one, and when there were no more lines left, they were pushed back across open country. 11th of November 1918, armistice. The war is over. In every church, the victory bells ring out. In every street, the people celebrate. There are flags everywhere. The king, commander-in-chief of the Belgian army, was welcomed in triumph at every town he passed. Those lucky enough to survive the slaughter were also welcomed home as heroes. The battlefields were silent. 
the cannons roared no more. Even so, the whole countryside was littered with the deadly refuse of war, as a former police officer from Ypres can testify. Bijna dagelijks werden wij opgeroepen om de vaststelling te doen van ontploffingen van. Almost every day, we were called on to make out reports for workers who had been blown up whilst trying to knock the copper bands off old shells. The lucky ones used to earn good money for the lead shrapnel balls, but it was dangerous work, since the shells were still full of high explosive, which could easily go off. Almost every day, or at least two or three times a week, we had to go out and collect up the shattered remains of the victims in sandbags. The shells that we recover are still filled with high explosive. We must be very careful that we do not exceed the limit of 50 kilograms of pure explosive or an equivalent amount of TNT per detonation. Of course, the total weight of the crates is much greater, 250 or sometimes 300 kilograms, but they can only contain a maximum of 50 kilograms of explosive. At Pool Capella, unexploded ammunition is still brought in nearly every day. Non-toxic items are placed in crates, which are then buried in pits before being detonated. At the end of the war, Ypres was a scene of total devastation. Around here, everything was shot to pieces, leveled to the ground. We could only come back once we had found a place to live. Everywhere, they were setting up barracks, little wooden barracks. Ici était la ville d'Ypres. This was the town of Ypres. So proclaimed a sign which was erected on the Great Market Square in 1919. This was the town of Ypres, past tense, as though nothing living could ever return here. However, the determined citizens of the ravaged town had other ideas. By the start of the 1920s, reconstruction was already underway, and in 1923 work on a great memorial, the Menin Gate, was also begun. There are 2,500 cubic meters of white stone in St. Martin's Cathedral and another 2,500 cubic meters in the Menin Gate. It's hard to believe that in those days everything was done by hand. The blocks of stone were delivered by train to the station where they were loaded manually onto a horse-drawn cart. It was Verdu, Platevoet and Klaassens who did all their work. It was them that brought it from the station to here. Everything was sold by hand, here at our house. There were no machines in those days. It was a hell of a job.
By 1927, this monument to the missing soldiers of the British Empire had been completed. Designed by Sir Reginald Bromfield, it was ceremonially opened by Field Marshal Plumer on the 24th of July in the presence of His Majesty King Albert I. Memorials to the Belgian fallen were also erected in almost every town and village in the land. Ypres was no exception. The public showed great gratitude and respect for those who had bought their freedom at so dear a price. The unveiling of every memorial was attended by large crowds, so as here in Porpering. And on every anniversary of Armistice Day, the local community stood ready to honour its dead, with flowers and music, and with prayers and speeches. The surviving veterans were also honoured with medals and decorations. Their fallen comrades were not forgotten, but were commemorated more quietly. Unlike Pompeii, it was decided that Ypres should not be left to stand as a permanent reminder of the awesome nature of disaster. Gradually the ruins were cleared away and the town was rebuilt in its original style. Oh yes, I saw Ypres for the first time uh, we, when we came up from the Somme in 1916, end of 19... Yeah, it will be, 1916, yeah. The cloth hall and all the old church there, it was all one, one break, everything. That, I came again in 79 and I couldn't believe my, my own eyes. It was re absolutely rebuilt. It was wonderful. Every evening since 1929, the last post has been sounded under the great memorial arches of the Menin Gate as a tribute to the fallen of all nations who died in the muddy fields around Ypres. Gate bears the names of 55,000 soldiers who were posted as missing in action. Even the seemingly endless panels of the gate were not large enough to carry all the names, and a second memorial wall with a further 35,000 names was erected at Tynecott Cemetery. Yet a further 12,000 are commemorated at Pukstiert, while soldiers from New Zealand are remembered on three smaller memorials, such as in Polygon Wood. In total, more than 100,000 officers and men with no known grave. Of this massive figure, some 60% lie unidentified under headstones bearing the simple inscription, a soldier of the great war, known unto God. Of the remaining 40,000, no trace was ever found, and still they lie beneath the fields of Flanders. The war is still ever present in this region, not only in the hundreds of cemeteries which dot the landscape, but also in the various museums, 
which give more modern visitors a brief insight into the terrible years of the Great Wall. The museum at Huge Crater is one such example. Not far from Huge lies Hill 62, where the last original stretch of trench line on the old Ypres salient can still be visited. And where a series of old-fashioned what the butler saw machines lay bare the horror and brutality of modern warfare. No detail, however gruesome, is spared. Zonnebaker and its surrounding villages played an important role during the First World War and the local museum brings to life a scene from the period. At Hill 60, nature has healed the savage destruction wrought by man. During quieter spells, the troops were allowed brief periods of rest behind the lines, at places such as Talbot House in Pulperingen. The Museum of Messines, the smallest town in Belgium, houses a rich collection of weaponry, uniforms, photographs and other memorabilia. The pride of place goes to a watercolour of the ruined town church, painted in 1914 by a certain Corporal Adolf Hitler. During the late 1990s, the old Ypres Salient Museum in the Cloth Hall was completely redesigned under the direction of Pete Heelens. The new in Flanders Fields Museum first opened its doors in 1998. In Flanders Fields offers the visitor a modern view of the First World War. Using the very latest museum techniques, the human story of the war is told, simply but movingly. Various objects from the war years are used to illustrate the life stories of soldiers, prisoners of war and refugees. In the casements beneath the old ramparts of Ypres, the British troops tried to cling on to some semblance of normal life. There was a newspaper press, a post office, even a cinema. Here the soldiers felt safe. Here they could finally escape from the almost ceaseless bombardments outside. These casements can still be visited under the guidance of experts such as Valère Prim. This was an entrance made by the English to give them more room and a place to shelter in. There was a kind of tunnel underneath the ground. The earth was dug out and the soldiers used to rest down there and take cover from the shelling. It was completely blast-proof. Of course, it's all bricked up now. Bits have collapsed and it's not safe anymore. It used to be shored up with wooden beams and even the old bit of a steel plating. But with the passage of time, it has all rotted and fallen in. And so now it's all bricked up. It's a pity, really. But after all this time, what can you expect? Even today, some 80 years after the armistice, there are still dozens of historians and enthusiastic amateurs who scour the landscape in search of traces of the war. 
At Sintiloe, near the Parling Bay Provincial Park, a collapsed dugout is located. Amidst the mud and slime, an old water pump is discovered and, after a few good pulls, is recovered. During archaeological works on the foundations of the church at Zonnebaker, another bunker is accidentally uncovered. Its precious contents are rescued, catalogued and removed to the local museum before water gradually reclaims the old shelter. At Weizvater, fate lent the historical investigators a hand. One evening, a farmer discovered one of his cows sunk up to its neck in mud and earth. The animal had fallen into a disused shaft, which led down to an underground tunnel. And uh, can I see it in Russia? I ran home as quickly as I could and told my father what had happened. We quickly got together about seven or eight men and set off back to the field. The entrances were full with water and the head of the cow was only just above the surface. Even so, we managed to get a rope behind her ears and after a good half hour's pulling, we finally got around. The poor beast was stiff with cold from being so long in the water. She had probably been there for one, two or maybe even three hours with just her head sticking out. Stiff as she was, we got her out and she managed to survive. A whole world of tragedy lies concealed beneath the fields of the West Hook, but little by little the past is being persuaded to give up her secrets, so as here, at Hellfire Corner, on the once notorious Menin Road. A 
And so the search goes on, and will continue to go on, as long as there are people dedicated enough to devote their free time to poring over every shovelful of spoil from building projects and roadworks, in the hope of discovering yet another piece of forgotten history. During the 1970s, various reconciliation meetings were arranged between the soldiers who had formerly been enemies. One such meeting took place at the home of the de Kiro van der Wege family in Kemmel. Here, more than 50 years after they had tried to kill each other, troops from the famous Das Grüne Korps finally extended the hand of friendship to Belgian and British veterans who had returned to Flanders as part of a tour organized by the British historian Lynn MacDonald. And still they come, these aged warriors, the last survivors of the Great War. Every year they are fewer, but still they visit the sites of their former exploits. Still they remember their old comrades, fallen so long ago. Under the Menin Gate they listen to the solemn music and to the prayers, but they listen perhaps most closely of all to the haunting words of Lawrence Binion's exhortation. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old, Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. The younger generations also wish to remember and to play their part. At the site where John McRae wrote in Flanders Fields, students from a local school in Ypres have renovated the dilapidated bunkers of the old dressing station. And new and sometimes gruesome discoveries continue to be made all the time. During recent roadworks in Zonnebaker, the bodies of six German soldiers were uncovered in a collapsed shelter dug into the embankment of the old Iberusalara railway. The mortal remains were removed by the local police and after due process of law will be handed over to the German War Graves Authority for burial at Langemark. And so the search goes on. The search for the last remains of a war that should never have happened. The search for the last victims. The search for the last survivors. At the beginning of the 1990s, work started in the Steenstraat barracks in Houtholst on the construction of a specially designed unit for the dismantling and decommissioning of chemical weapons. The building is equipped with X-ray equipment to allow easy identification of problem munitions. The explosive element is removed and neutralized using robots 
and the shells are drilled through to allow the chemical elements to be separated. A specialist waste disposal company then destroys these chemicals by incinerating them at very high temperatures. Each potentially dangerous shell must be individually checked and emptied. At a current rate of 15 shells per day, it will take several years to destroy the existing stockpiles in Hautelost. Yet even when the last veteran is dead and the last shell has been removed from the soil of Flanders, it will remain important that this war should not be forgotten. For as a wise man once said, he who does not know his history is doomed to repeat it.